Welcome. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start by explaining that I, I consider myself expert-ish as a presenter. Um, I look across the room and notice that there are some of us who are probably not new to this. Uh, but I, I believe that no matter how good you are, um, seeing more would be uh, valuable, right? So hopefully, even if you're really good at this, you'll find something that you can use in this uh, session. And I really wanted to do these because I've been to a few of them where people tell you uh, kind of at a high level what would be good, but you really never, say, they never give you practical, pragmatic points. So I'm trying as hard as I can to give practical, pragmatic, valuable content. So in your comments, if you don't see that, please let me know. So how many times have you been in this presentation? Perhaps even <laughs> this week, <laughs> right? And you know, the, the horrible thing is this person at the front of the room is probably a very smart person, very bright, very capable, just really not good at presenting. And it sure kills everything. And we, we certainly know that. In fact, I believe that Salvador Dali created the persistence of time, this particular piece of, piece of art, uh, while watching a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so what I want to do is kind of break this down a little bit. I want to talk about how to get started. Let's talk about creating a presentation. We'll talk about some of the speaking tricks of the trade. Finally, um, a post-mortem which I don't think most people do enough. They basically finish their presentation, and they're like, God, it's done. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld once said that uh, people are actually more frightened of giving a presentation than dying. So statistically, you're better off being the corpse than the guy who's giving the eulogy, right? So what I want to do is kind of make you feel a little bit better about that. And then finally, I really want to talk about dealing with questions in a presentation. And in the beginning, the most important thing to do is to start with a plan, right? We have to be able to say, what do I want to do? What do I want to get done here? How do I want this to work? And if you don't have a plan, if you can't work your way through this, you're never going to really hit the mark. It's amazing to me how few people really think about the messages they want to create, the messages they want to go out before they present. They get up and they show a bunch of facts, they connect a bunch of things together, but it leaves the audience wondering, what is it he wanted me to do? What were the things that, that was supposed to get out of this? Or, boy, that was really something. Now what? So I think it's really important that we start with a plan, have an objective, figure out what I want to say, make sure that I get the message out. And after that, everything flows. So conceptualize. i got to define the scope. One of the things that people do wrong when they create presentations is they try to jumble too many different things in at the same time. Generally, you only have a few minutes out of an hour where everybody is paying attention, or any one person is paying attention. And you really want to make sure that they get a key message in that time, hopefully all of your key message in that time. But if you have too many messages and they're all jumbled around, they're going to be missed. And that would be horrible, because you've not only wasted your time, you've wasted the time of everybody in the room. And so when you're building a presentation, you should be thinking about, who are, who's my audience? What do they want? The W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me, right? What is the what's in it for me, for the client, for the listener, for the person who's going to have this message, right? I want to make sure that they care, because if I can do that, then everything else falls through, right? And then finally, outlines. 
I have to outline it to make sure that I have a structure to my messaging and then set of titles. The structure is really, really important. I gotta be able to have a way of driving the conversation. I gotta have a set of basic rules. I want to talk a little bit about openings, grabbers, and closing. So here's the structure that I often look at. You have to have a strong opening. You have to grab them in the beginning. If you don't grab them in the beginning, you won't have them forever. So I have a strong opening. I want to answer some kind of question that they're asking. I want to then pr provide a premise. I want to follow that up with a set of wisdom, have explanation as examples of that, and then I'm going to transition to something else. And I'll probably do that a couple of times for all the key messages that I want to do, and then finally have a really strong closing. Openings are the most important part. It's what grabs people, it gets people in, gets them paying attention throughout the session. Here are some things that I think are really, really useful to do that. One of them is, is wordplay. So for wordplay, you may say something like, um, what do these three things have in common? Or here are three different things that, would, that would, you wouldn't think to put together. A lot of times when I'm doing an agenda chart, I'll take pictures. You can see there are always a lot of pictures in my, my presentation. I'll take all the pictures or key pictures from my presentation and I'll put them up on the, on the chart in the very beginning. And that's my agenda chart. And I'll say something like, hey, what do these 10 pictures have in common? By the end of this session, you will understand how they're all connected. And that kind of thing starts to bring people in because they're sitting there going, yeah, what, what do those things have in common? Why do you have them together? What does it mean? That kind of thing helps. Another great place to start is stories. If I can start with a good story of how things happen. You really want, want to get people's attention. Here's a great thing to do. You're in a group of people and somebody's walking up and you want to get their attention. Say something like this. And there I was, a whole jar of mayonnaise in one hand, a wolf biting my foot in the other, and I still had 15 minutes left to go. And just leave it like that, right? That'll be, a, what the hell is going on with that guy, right? Getting those kinds of stories, those mini dramas, right? are really important. Another really key thing to be able to do is to do a big picture. What's the big picture? How does it all connect together? This doesn't happen very often in presentations because people focus on something in particular. And so they kind of start with, let me show you a chart of things. And so having this kind of thought process really helps you. So you have this word play, could be numbers, I tell stories. Another thing that's really, really valuable is having props. When I, I was working in, in Poughkeepsie a lot, we'd have uh, a person who really would tell people about connectivity to the system. We called her Connie Connectivity because she, she would always really help people understand what was connected. And she would bring in channel cables and she would bring in, in props and actually seeing and touching the props and saying, oh, I see how this connects is a really, really powerful value. And then finally, this kind of mini drama, and I'll talk a little bit more about that kind of thing a little bit later, but giving that before and after helps to bring people in. And then finally, having a powerful close, right? I really want my closing to punch, right? Because the last things that people hear, the last part is what they'll remember. That's what you want them to use as they're going out. Now, one of the things I try to do is, at the end of this, try to connect it to something that happened in the beginning. Bring it around so that people can see the connection. Remember the rule of three, and this is something that is valuable throughout your presentation. There's something magical about three. Three things, it's easy to remember. It, it's something that connects. 
it's, it's more than two, because two is like just a couple, right? And it's better than four because it's not too many things. I want to try and keep in that rule of three. And then one of the things, and we do this, everybody does this. Everybody, especially in a conference like this, what's the last thing they have? What's the last chart they have? Questions. Anybody have questions? So what do you do when, some, when you're in a presentation and it's been a long hour? I mean, it's been a really long hour. And you see that questions chart. What's the first thing you do? I start packing up. Or, you know, somebody said, no, Frank, you, you stop snoring. Right. I start packing up. Everybody's packing up. Everybody's ready to go. They're, they're out. So before your last chart, you try and get some of those questions in so that people stay engaged. Because when they think it's over, they're gone. The coffee's out there, or it's almost lunchtime, or it's time to, it's time to get drinks at the expo or whatever, right? You want to make sure that you have them for the full time. Okay. Okay. It's kind of a basics. We've done kind of a basics. I want to show you this video. I want you to pay attention carefully to this video. And we practice this in rehearsal. You could actually hear it before. And it's not working. Okay, I can tell you what he's saying. Count, how many passes do the guards make? The guards in the white, how many passes do they make? Everybody get it? 24? But did you notice the guy stealing the vase? How many people were able to notice the counting and the vase? Raise your hand if you were able to notice the counting vase. Okay. You guys are unique. Most people can do one or the other. And there are two things I want to talk about with this, because originally what I want you to think of is if you don't have people in the beginning of your session, by the time the really important stuff comes, they're not there. They're thinking about, oh, what other sessions do I have? What else could I be doing? Or, right? And once that happens, they're going to miss your point. Really important to grab them. And then ultimately, what I want to make sure is that they're paying attention to me. I'm the one that's presenting. But what happens? You go to a presentation, and you see charts like this one. And I don't know about you guys, but when I see a chart like this, a part of me dies inside. Right? Because instead of paying attention to what I want you to pay attention to, you're paying attention to something else. And over and over again, I try and make sure that people are doing what I want them to do. And every time they go looking at the chart deck, they're not listening to the things that I care about, the things I want them to do, the things I want them to see. And it takes a long time to get that message, to get you back paying attention to me when you're paying attention to the to the presentation charts. Has everybody gotten to the bottom? I don't think so, because nobody yelled, I'm bored. And therefore, you lost the opportunity to get the $500 prize. <laughs> Less is more. If there's something that you want them to hear, tell them. Don't put it on the chart. The chart should point to the, peop to the things you want to say, to highlight it for them. But all the important stuff you should be telling them. 
right? That keeps them with you. I used to, I, I've been presenting for 30 years, and what I've found in that time uh, is that people say, you should have a set of charts that stand on their own. Right? I hear this at IBM all the time, your charts should stand on their own. No, if the charts stand on their own, what do they need me for? Read the damn charts yourself, right? Charts should be about you. Okay, wordy charts are bad. Well, how about charts with pictures? Charts with pictures are good, right? Like this one. This is a good chart, it's pictures. It's got a bunch of TLAs, and everybody knows what all the TLAs are, so I'm gonna keep going, right? And I can't tell how many sessions I've been. Again, smart people, they know what they're talking about. They show a deck like this and they say, yeah, we had this stuff and we did this and we did that, right? And you're so busy going, well, what the heck is OMG? And you're thinking, oh my God, or maybe something worse, I don't know, but you're not thinking what he wants you to think about. But don't worry, he's gonna make it easy. He's gonna explain it to you. So he'll cover it up with a bunch of words, right? The horrible thing is you've been in presentations where you've seen charts like this, right? Over and over again. It's a very simple thing not to do. And you're never gonna get people to pay attention unless your charts are simple, straightforward, and show that flow. Your audience should need you. They should be listening to you. The charts should be supporting you. Often when I do presentations, uh, some of you have seen me present, I don't usually use any words. Most of my charts are mostly pictures, usually something like this along with them. But the real focus should be on whatever you're trying to get them across. Okay. Beat that to death. Has anybody done these? You know what these are? The, the rebuses? You know what they, can, can anybody guess what they are? Read some of them out. Middle-aged, this one's middle-aged. Ice cube, what about this one? Down in the dumps, good. Split level, once upon a time. Piggyback ride, and what's the last one? Gross injustice. See, now, you look at that and you're like, oh, that's obvious. Every one of those is obvious to you now. Were they all obvious to you at, at the beginning? No. Here's something that we all do, and I am guilty of this as well. We take the knowledge that we have the things that we think are obvious, and we start presenting from that. And there are people in your audience who have no idea what you're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me, so it's really, really easy to get lost in a session. Take the time to make sure that people understand it. And if you, see, I hate this, people go, does everybody know when I talk about ZOS, right? And of course, most people go, yeah, sure, right? If you're in a room and 30 people are in the room and 25 of them go, yeah, I know, those other five are gonna go, yeah, yeah me too, right? Because nobody wants to be the idiot. So don't assume people know this. And be careful when you ask the question, you should be looking, at, you can't do that in this room because the lights are right in my eyes, but. Um, you should be looking in the eyes of the people to see, are they just raising their hand because everybody else is? And you can tell because they'll raise their hand, but the fear is still in their eyes. Right? I have no idea what he's saying. This man really cares about what I have no idea. Right? Let's make sure that we don't lose our audience just because we think they understand everything we're talking about. There's a really interesting study. They took a group of people 
And they said, I want you to meet this man. His name is, is uh, Mr. Baker. And then uh, another group of people, same group, uh, different group of people, the same number of people, he said, hey, I want you to meet this guy. He's a baker. The people who heard, this is Mr. Baker, over half of them forgot his name. But every single one remembered he was a baker. Why? Because when you say baker, that picture comes into your mind. Right? When I think of a baker, I think of a man with a hat, and he's got the... I don't know if that's a pie or a bread or I don't know, something. But I know he's baking, right? When you use words that are concrete, that create an image in people's mind, they remember. Right? Making sure that you build concrete things around what you're doing really helps people. The more abstract stuff we talk about, and we talk about a lot of abstract stuff as technical people, what we want to make sure is that we root it in something concrete. This is why having real things to touch helps, because it allows people to get that connection and want to make that connection. This is really, really hard to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort but it's well worth it. Imagine you have a room of 30 people. That's 30 hours invested in the work that you're doing. In order to take advantage of that, you should be putting 30 hours worth of your time in. Right? Because you want to make sure that you're optimizing that time. I'm a firm believer in taking your audience on a journey with you. And as you do that, people get interested. They want to be part of that story. Take them on the journey. I was, earlier in my career, I was working with a bunch of business partners to get them to use Unix system services. And I was working with one business partner who had uh, written code on a Unix platform and it ported the code to ZOS, to use ZOS Unix. And he said, well, ZOS Unix sucks because this takes five minutes on my Unix platform and it takes two hours on the mainframe. So the mainframe sucks. Well, that's weird. Why is that happening? So we looked through some of his code. He's showing me some of the code. And it turns out that everything is exactly the same except at the end. At the end, he generates a file. And in the Unix system, the file is an ASCII. In the mainframe, the file is an EPSTIC. So he has to translate it back to ASCII. Right? So we're looking at this, and, and uh, I'm looking at some of the reports, and 92% of the time, was in that last piece of code where he's doing the, the translation. So he said, well, let's, let's look carefully at this. Right? So he's got, he's got a file. The files, at the time, it was like 10 meg or something like that. 10 meg file of EBCDIC characters he's going to turn into ASCII. So it's, it's C code, and he do, does a get S. Right? So he, he's getting a string, he's getting a line, right? He's looking for that end of line character. In some cases, he was getting three or four characters right, at a time. Now, it would vary somewhere more, somewhere less. And then he would say, OK, I've got this buffer. I'm going to open the translate table now. He'd open the translate table. And then he'd malloc a data space. And then he'd copy. His read in stuff. Yeah, you, could, you, you know where this is going. He'd copy the stuff into his space, and then he'd translate it, and then he'd copy it somewhere else, and then he would write it out. And then he would close the table, and then he would go get the next string and do it all over again. And 
I almost used a bad word. I said to him, wouldn't it be cool, since we're translating, if we opened the translate table before we started reading the data in, and then we closed it when we were done? Wouldn't that be cool? And the guy goes, yeah, we could, we could do that. That, that kind of makes sense. I said, we have a 32K buffer here. Instead of reading line by line, why don't we you know, pull in 32K? And then we could do that, and then it'll be a little bit faster. Don't you think it goes, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I said, and since we've got it all right in that buffer, why don't we just translate it right there? Then we don't have to worry about mallocking spaces or anything. We just translate it right there. He goes, that, that's a really good idea. I said, yeah, and then, since we have that space, why don't we write from that space into the file? And the guy goes, that's an awesome idea. I know. Right? Suddenly, the two-hour translation dropped down to, I think it was like 50 seconds. Right? And then I asked him what he thought of the operating system now. Oh, oh, it's better than I thought, right? Take your audience on a journey like that. Rely on uh, authorities. It's always good to have something to back you up. This isn't me saying this. This is him saying this, right? And doesn't he look way more trustworthy than me, right? John's like, yeah, damn straight, yeah. And sometimes you don't even have to use heroes. You could use anti-heroes, right? Have you seen these smoking commercials where they, they show a person uh, who's, who, whose fingers are missing because they had, had to have amputations or they're, they're, they're talking about their COPD because of this? This is really an anti-authority. Right? They know what they know because they did it all wrong. Right? That's the way I look at my life. My life is a warning for others. Don't be like Frank. Right? The value of authority and anti-authority is very powerful. I want you to look at this chart. Look how important the words you have say in a presentation. Look how important they are. Not, not very. Not very much at all. 7% of, of the power of your presentation is the words you use. That will jump up incredibly high if you start swearing every second. But that's probably not what you want to do. People are not going to be moved by your words alone. You have to use your voice. You have to use your body. You have to let people see how important this stuff is for you. Because if it isn't, if you, who are standing up in front of a group of people, don't care about this, then why should I? And this is one of the reasons why when that person creates that chart, uh, that huge word chart and they're reading them. I want to tell you about this really important. The guy I used to work with is like that. He's, he's a great guy, smart guy, and this, he'd present this. I'm really excited about something I'm going to show you right now. He was a little bit older, but it, this is really, really good stuff. How do you get excited if, if he's not going to get excited? It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Now, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, right? But I want you to at least try to be a little bit more like William Shatner. You know, William Shatner is the 
the master of pause acting, right? Some of us who are older will know this from, right? He really wants you to understand whatever he's talking about. There's a value in pausing. There's a value in letting people think for a second about what you're talking about. You know what kills, you know what the worst, the opposite of pause acting is? Or pause presentation? The opposite is probably you've seen a dozen times this week. I call it um presentations. I want to tell you um, about the things that I um, think are really um, important. I am the worst person in your audience because I'm sitting there going, one um, two um, three um. Sometimes I'll, if I have a piece of paper, I'm writing them down. You know what um is? Um is your body going, okay, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? When I hear people say um, I say, you haven't practiced enough. Because you're, you're trying to catch up. What do I do next? What do I do next? Um, now. Don't, um. If you, if you need that moment, take that moment. They'll think you're thinking. This is why I wear a beard. You know, see, it works. You thought I was thinking. Right? It works. Just stop. It's okay. Silence is great. When you are silent, people stop. <laughs> it's a really, really powerful thing. And it kind of goes with this next concept of be like an orchestra. My, my son, for years, was in a string orchestra. He loves to play the violin. And he was eight or nine, and he joined this, this group. And you've been to these, right? You've been to a bunch of these, if you have kids. And you go there, and usually you try to take Valium first or, or something, because you know it's going to suck. And you're going to spend all your time trying to figure out, what the hell is the song they're playing? Right? So I go there. And I was amazed because these kids had been taught how to do it right. Sometimes the music would speed up. Sometimes it would slow down. Sometimes it would be loud. Sometimes it would be soft. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. This is like music, right? Your presentation should be like music. Vary your speed. Vary the volume. I love this. If you are going to tell somebody something important, Whisper it. Not so quiet that nobody can hear, but notice the difference between me up here talking about really important stuff, and it was just so obvious. And having that change draws people in. And that's what we're trying to do, is draw people in, become part of the conversation. People, and, and we've kind of heard this already this week, people don't do things the same. We're not all the same. And you look at this, you say, this is the different ways people learn. People learn by seeing. People learn by listening. And people learn kinesthetically or by touch or by, by doing. Right? Now, only 20% of the people learn visually. 20% of the people learn visually. That's a pretty small number. And so if you're showing a bunch of stuff on the chart, because that's what's going to get people, only 20% of the people are going to get, right? 40% of the people learn by hearing. And the rest are kinesthetic. Learn by doing, by even touching. Part of my problem is I'm mostly kinesthetic. So I get in a presentation. And unless you're really good, like John was, you fall asleep. I fall asleep. I, I, I no longer, I always sit in the back now. I was, I was in the company a week. I was in my company a week. And I had to go because they have to teach me because I don't know anything. So I'm sitting front row, center, 
this is me, front row center, first time I'm in a classroom presentation, boss is there, this is me. The guy who was hired with me was trying to throw pennies in my mouth, right? You have to, you have to capture, keep them moving. Try and hit those different things. How do I get people involved? How do I get them doing? Think back to the keynote on Monday. She got us standing up. She got us laughing and pointing at people. We were, at, we were able to be derisive about you know, friends, friends and people we know. She kept getting us involved by hitting different senses. So no matter what, how you learned, she touched you. I'm a firm believer in making people laugh. One of the best ways, the easiest ways to engage people is to make them laugh. Now, this won't work for everybody. Not everybody's funny. John, no, sorry. <laughs> Not everybody's funny. Right? But being able to connect to people through laughter does two things. You know, a lot of times you say, start your presentation with a joke. Do you know why they say that? Two reasons. One, it immediately lightens up the audience a little bit. Ah, look, he's funny. I hope he does that again. The other thing is, it provides you feedback right away. When people are laughing at something you say, ah, it makes me feel good. Oh, they're with me. We're together, right? It's really reinforcing. My dad was a teacher in the army, and he said that the army taught him how to teach too. Of course, they do everything. And according to the rules in the army, he had to tell a joke every 15 minutes. One joke every 15 minutes. Why? To keep them engaged. Right? Keep them engaged. Now, you got to be careful with humor. Humor is dangerous because you can say things that you think are funny that just aren't. Right? So you got to be careful. Stories are always better. Signature stories, stories that drive the point home help, especially if they're funny. Remember my story about the business partner who wrote crappy, I mean, who couldn't understand how to best use the operating system, right? The funny bits were about him learning. Learning because it's obvious to you, but learning, right? Signature stories, not jokes. Now, having said that, you know, jokes along the way are kind of, uh, can, can lighten it, but you have to be careful. Again, we're back to the rule of three. If I'm trying to do these things, threes are a magical number. Doing that, having that capability is, is really important. And then ultimately, I want to create in your mind that visual picture. The absurdity of it. And I happen to like comedy, the absurd, um, because it fits, our, um, <laughs> it fits our world so well, right? And it drives that picture home, right? Because you can imagine some of the things happening. And it's cathartic. It's definitely cathartic. I like to, uh, I'm not doing it in this presentation, but I like to do callbacks. If I can get you laughing in the beginning at something, I like to call that back and get you back to that moment. Right. This is great when you can make fun of somebody in the audience, you go back to them, right, John? Um, <laughs> right? So you go back and call back. And then people start to get into being part of that. And then by the end of the presentation, we're all making fun of John. And isn't that what everybody wants, right? It's amazing in our industry that there are so many good jokes out there, right? I love this one. Last year, we recognized that our processes were far too complex, so we put them into the cloud. Way better. Yeah, that's, that's how that works. Right? And you can use humor to really drive even a technical point home. I love this one. Try and teach people about non-repudiation. 
Well, it's non-repudiation. I don't know if you uh, watch or check out XKCD. It's a great webcomic. You should check it out if you don't. But I love this one. He's calling in to his friend in the help desk. He says, hey, I lost the server password. What is it again? He, she goes, oh, it's, wait, how do I really know it's you? He goes, oh, good question. I bet we can truck construct a cool proof identity protocol. I'll start by picking two random, oh no, it's you, I got it. <laughs> no, that's not the way this is supposed to work. If you've been presenting, especially at a conference like this and it's after lunch, right? You're here, it's after lunch, you know what everybody's doing. They're still digesting the pasta they had, or maybe the rice or something, and it's Frank in the middle row. Ah, right? Is there anything worse than that when you're presenting? Yes, it's the guy who walks out. What did I do? Why are you leaving me? Don't let that bother you. You've got a room of people, and it's like they're pouring wine. Not everybody wants the wine, okay. Well, I'm not gonna pour it in your glass if you're not gonna drink it, that stuff is expensive. Right? I'm looking for people who want to know. I will keep pouring wine in their glass. Right? Find the people whose glasses look like they need wine. Okay, I've talked about a lot of this. Think of your presentation as a personal conversation with 30 or 40 or however many people. Right? I want to drive that home. I want to make that emotional and intellectual connection. And that's why I like to stop. I like to draw these mental pictures. Usually, not a room like this when I can't see, I like to have more eye contact, I like to see that I'm talking to you because I care about what you think. I want questions in it because I want you to be connected to me, to be part of this. And you know, it's all about movement and body language because you betray your thoughts in your actions. It's really important. And then this is really important, rehearse. If you think you've rehearsed enough, you haven't. I rehearsed this, and rehearsed this, and rehearsed this, and rehearsed this. Literally for years, <laughs> I've rehearsed this presentation, right? Because that makes a difference. Okay. Oh, this is one of these charts. I stole this chart from somebody, and I can't stand this. Hold on. Okay. Now, a little bit more on this rehearse thing. Don't memorize, extemporize. If you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, and you know it, and trust that you know it. If you try to memorize, this is what happens, you memorize. I'm memorizing this stuff, I'm memorizing, I'm memorizing, I get up, I get up. All right, I'm starting. And you start, and you forget something. And so in your mind, you're going back to the thing that you forgot. And you're supposed to be moving on, but your mind is back at, hey, you forgot that sentence, and now half the stuff you said doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, my God. And you die. My first time at Cher, years ago, I was doing a chart deck for a friend of mine. Uh, some of you may remember Highland Potter. Um, and this would become a pattern in our relationship. He would sign up for sessions, he would build the charts, and then he would go on vacation. And he would say, I'm not going to be there. Frank, you do the presentation for me. And I would say, okay, because I was stupid. And then I would come here and he would be on a beach somewhere, and I'd be presenting. And back then, we didn't have cell phones, but we did have pagers. And he, from the beach, wherever that guy was, would text me, Frank, your fly is down. Because that's the kind of guy he is. 
So I'd have a presentation that somebody else created. And he would read them through with me once. And then I would come here and I would get into to a room beforehand so I could practice. And I'd look at the charts and I'd go, what am I going to say to this? And so for hours before I would come into a room like this, I would stare at these charts and I would say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to talk about these things. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I come into this room and I have the charts and I get up and I don't do anything like what I rehearsed. Nothing. Zero. But it didn't matter because I had gotten to the point where I knew I wanted to talk about a set of things. And it didn't match anything that I had memorized. But the people who are listening, they don't know what you memorized. They just want to hear what you have to say. I happen to think that when you're presenting, it's a little bit like doing stand-up. right? When a comic gets up and does stand-up, he doesn't say, OK, I'm going to do this, and then I walk and I do this. He has bits, and he's built those bits, but he doesn't know what order he's going to do them in or how he's going to put them together. He's reading the audience. And he knows that certain bits are go well with other bits. If they work with the audience, that's what he's going to use. And if they don't, he'll go to a different set. He's always reading the audience. You should be reading the audience. What's working for them? How do these things work for me? What is going to get them to the message I care about now? That's really, really important. Don't memorize, extemporize. OK. This is the hard part. Uh, when you're done with a presentation, try and figure out what you did right, what you did wrong. Have somebody in the room that you trust enough to give you an honest opinion. I have spent a fair amount of time doing keynote sessions. I was doing a set of keynotes last year, and a guy who actually does this presentation with me sometimes is in the back of the room. I do my session, and I do a good job. I think I do pretty good. And I go to him at the end. I said, how'd I do? And he said, well, OK. All right. What do I do to fix it? Right. You, you let your pride go somewhere else. <laughs> and you say, what could I do better? How can I make those messages clearer? And they can always be clear. No matter how many times you've done it, no matter how good it is, there's always a way to do it better. Right? This is the art. This is something you want to get better at. And by doing it, and finding out what I do, what I don't do well. Earlier in the week, I, was, I saw a kid do a really good presentation. He's obviously relatively new at it. He got up and he gave it. And he, the, what, the stuff he was saying was great. But he was doing it like this. It was just too quiet. For a larger room, he couldn't be heard. And it's like, dude, you're good. These are great. Here's what you need to do. And they're simple fixes. But if nobody told me, because you're the first person to tell me that, well, <laughs> it's a simple fix, right? Don't you want to know if there's a simple fix to make your stuff better? Seek out somebody who will work with this on you. Things like this, where we have uh, uh, write-ins and, and the ability to critique your presentation are really, really valuable. It's peer review, right? So when the time comes and we say, Fill out your session evaluations. We want to know what's better, what's good, what's bad, what should I have changed? And don't just go, he was great, sure, or he sucked, forget it. Why? What should I fix? How should I get better? That takes more time, right? Which is why most people don't do it. But it really would be good to get a couple of people, right? I try to get people that I know to come and, and listen to the presentation to comment. And I don't need people to tell me I'm great. I already know, heart in my heart, I'm, I'm great. I tell myself that all the time. What I need is somebody to go, that wasn't that good. Or, I, it would be better if. 
Could you have done that better? Right? Simple things. Simple things make a big difference. Trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. Right? Little things can make a big difference. OK. Everybody with me still? Handling questions. To me, this is really, really important because, yes, we have questions. And uh, I mentioned already, I prefer to take questions all the way throughout. Don't wait till the end. You wait till the end. People have already mentally checked out. Also, when you're handling questions during the session, people are engaged. The more you can get people engaged, the more you can keep them engaged, the better off you are. Remember, nobody's paying attention to you the full time. So you want to keep trying to connect to them to keep that to happen. Here's another mistake people get, and, and this is really bad for technical people, especially if you're really excited about the topic. Somebody asks a question, you're like, I know the answer to this one, and you start answering it. But the person in the front of the room asks the question, and the people in the back have no idea what he said, because he said it to his shoes, or maybe off to the side, and everybody else is going, well, I'm going to try and figure out what the question is based on the answer. Just repeat the question. In fact, one of the things I like to do, again, is to have somebody in the room to remind me to do that. If they're sitting in the front, or maybe if they're sitting in the back, I'll go, repeat the question. Or I'll have them make a gesture. Repeat the question. I, you got to be careful how you, people do this. I mentioned Highland Potter. Highland would sit in the back of a session when I was doing it, and he would do this. Now, you all don't know what that means, but in sign language, this is a bull, and this is what he's doing. Right? It's really not what you want somebody to be doing. Right? But having somebody there to help remind you of what's going on in the room is really, really important, because you won't be paying attention as much. Try to remember to repeat the question. I already mentioned this. Now, this is the most important one, especially for technical people. I love this, because there are people in our business who don't ask questions because they want the answers. They ask questions to either make themselves look good or you look bad. Now, I never do that unless, you know, I really want to mess with the presenter. But here's a couple of questions. Let's, let's take some of the questions that people ask and kind of break it down. What should we do? I love the underminer. I love this. I think I understand what you're trying to say here. It's not, not an easy topic. Not everyone is able to really describe the challenges. You did your best. Good try. Right? That's a great question to field. Well, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I love that kind of question, you asshole. Um, um, thank you. It was very helpful. Maybe you shouldn't use that last part. Leave the last part. Out. Thank you. Right? Take it as a compliment. How about this one? Hi, I'm Steve from Accounting. Nice to see everyone. Great presentation, by the way. I really enjoyed it. I'm not usually a PowerPoint guy, you know, since I'm a Mac guy. But you were able to keep me absorbed for the past 15 minutes. So I have a question. He doesn't even care about the question that he asked. He doesn't. He really wanted to say that first part. That's what he cared about. Do not roll your eyes at this person. Let everybody else do it. Right? Just answer the question. Yes, that's uh, 42. Go on. Oh, I love this one. And there's always somebody in the room. Who, on slide 13, the second table, six column across, 12th row down, you seem to be missing a decimal point. Was that intentional? Why, yes, yes, it was. It was intentional. It was a test, and you passed. I noticed that you didn't talk about the latest findings from North America regarding the rising consumer demand of the post-90 generation. Could you share your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. 
I think it would be good for us to have that conversation after the session is over, right? Which is perfect because he won't seek you out. He never cared about that. He was just trying to ambush you. He won't come up to you at the end. You never have to see him again. And the rest of the people are going, oh my God. Of course, if you can somehow bring it back to your main point <laughs> and drive that home, that's even better. Right. Uh, we're in the home stretch, I, I promise. I love this one. Now, the thing about this one, this is not somebody who's trying to ruin your day. This is probably somebody who genuinely cares about the topic. I have three questions. OK, my first question has two parts. Part 2A is, right? And they have a really good question, a really detailed question, and maybe a detailed question in an area you really care about. The problem is you have now reduced your audience from 30 or 40 or whatever it is to one. And the rest of the people have no idea what you're talking about. So the danger is here, oh my God. <laughs> Now I'm down this rat hole with this person. And I've lost everybody else. And once you lose them, it's hard to get them back again. So that's a really good question, a really good set of questions. We should talk about that afterward. OK, because that's a great one over a beer. See, if you do that, again, you're never going to give them the beer. But you sound generous. Well, do it over a beer. I can't wait for you to buy it for me. So we've done questions. We've done, uh, uh, we talked a little bit about how we want to orchestrate the way we do this. We've talked about how to create presentations and how those pieces all fit together. We make sure that we limit the scope of our stuff to make sure that we can get the messages that we want within that time frame. We talked about making sure that we tell stories and bring people along in the journey. We want to make sure that we're doing a presentation and not documentation, right? We want, don't want the charts to stand on their own. We want to be part of this together. We don't end with questions, which I'm going to do in a second. Oh, this is another one. This is great. Check your tech in advance. And this is a really important thing. When you're presenting, <laughs> make sure that everything works beforehand, so that thing that I wanted to do with the video works. It worked in rehearsal, which is pretty funny. Right? Right? Check it in advance. Uh, I, I created a set of charts for somebody, and uh, <laughs> I created a set of charts for him, and he didn't look at them in advance. And so I put a hidden slide in there that says, uh, Carlos will buy everybody in the audience beer after the session. And he's got his clicker, and he's going through, hits that chart, and everybody rejoices in the room. And he's like, wow, I'm doing great. <laughs> Check it in advance. Right. Remember this pouring wine thing? Be connected to the people who care. And this is the important thing. People don't remember tech. They don't remember a bunch of facts but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That's what you want to be connected to. OK, a lot of stuff, a lot of different things. Are there problems that you have that I haven't talked about? Are there things that really have been bothering you about presentations, or I wish I, I didn't do, or I wish I did do, or that you'd like to bring up for us all to discuss? Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the question was, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't say it as well as you did. Uh, Frank, they make me put these things together, and I'm stuck with them, right? 
I need to provide documentation, and the chart deck is the documentation, right? Well, how do I get that happy medium between providing the documentation and telling the story? Now, uh, most people will tell you the best thing to do is to say, oh, don't read this slide. Uh, it's just for your, for your edification. How many people pay attention when they do that? No, I'm looking at the slide. There must be something cool in there. Right? PowerPoint is by far the worst way to document things ever. It is. If you need to give them documentation, give them a couple of handouts. Better yet, give them something that points to somewhere where you can down, they can download it so they're not carrying paper around. Right? We live in a digital time. Right? It's just not a good way to document. It just isn't. So I'd much rather say, hey, I've got some detail around this. I'm going to get, give it to you. I've only got an hour. You're not going to get all this detail. But there's a link at the end of this presentation to all a whole bunch of things I need you to have. And I'll reference, I may reference them throughout the presentation. Hey, check out this document. It's going to give you the details on how you can use ZOSMS. Check this out. It's going to have the details on why ZOS Connect is going to change the way you do things. Right? And that's enough. Remember, you're trying to get people to do something. That's what your presentation is about. Even if it's supposed to be um, educational, people only learn, at our age anyway, people only learn about things they care about. Let's make them care and point them to stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, but you're not going to do it. I appreciate it, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm not doing that. You know what? That's a lot of work. What I just said is a lot of work. But that's, that's really the best way to do it. Other questions, and I'll try to remember to repeat them. Yes, sir. Oh, this is going to be a bad question. Yes. I know where you're going to go. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so my, my, uh, I'm presenting to a team across the world, and we use this horrible thing called telephones. How do you present? And the horrible thing about this is you know that nobody's listening to you. They are all reading their email or Slack or they're watching Oprah or whatever. Right? And you know this for a fact because when you say, hey, isn't that right, John? And he says, could, could you ask that question again? I hate presenting over the phone. So what I try to do again, my charts are all about pictures. Right? I, this presentation I did, and, and, and Gary will back me up. He's in the back. He'll tell you. He hates my presentations because they're all pictures, right? So there's a set of pictures there. They cannot just look at your slides. What I try to do is have a slide that gets people to go, what the hell is he going to say about this? How has this got anything to do with whatever it is I want to hear about? Uh, but your point is, is well taken. Even with a web conference, um, it's really, really hard to get people engaged. And it's impossible to read an audience you can't see. So don't do it. No longer, no. <laughs> I wish it was that simple. It is the, that is the hardest way to present, I think. Yes, sir? The, the best way to end the presentation is to point to that set of points you want them to walk away with. So before your last slide, you say, before I end this, and you start with it, before I end this, what do you think about? Right, try to make the, point, the questions a little bit pointed. Go across the different points that are important to you and say, hey, well, you guys have questions about this or about that, or what do you think about this? Does that make sense? You can even do them along the path as you get to end. Remember, as I was doing this, I would say things like, does that make sense to you? Right. And if you're really mean, you start to point to people. Hey, does that make sense to you? Right? And you're like, well, why are you pointing to me? I'm just trying to stay awake. 
right? But then your last slide should be the things that matter. So we've talked about these things. Here's what's important. And you can say, it. here's what's important. I want you to remember this. Right? If you forget everything about what I've, else I've said, remember how important it is to be connected to your audience. Now you know what's really important. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>